My name is Zeriel and I'm one of the admins of the Christian Think Tank PH. I mainly manage our YouTube channel and do some media stuff on the side. So we're going to post videos multiple times a week. If you like apologetic theology or Christian thought in general, please make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell button so you won't miss any future content we put out there. So uh, I know you're here to, take, to check out the lecture. Let's get right into it. So back in January 10 of this year, we had Dr. J.B. Stump to present uh, a lecture with the title, Is Evolution Compatible with Christianity? Dr. Stump earned his PhD at Boston University and is currently the Vice President of BioLogos. He has written books such as How I Changed My Views About Evolution and, and he co-edited The Blackwell Companion to Science and Christianity. So if you want to check his bio, we're going to put a link down in the description below. So uh, without further ado, let's get right into the lecture. Please enjoy! Greetings from uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ in the United States. I live in the Eastern time zone, and so the sun is just coming up on my uh, Sunday today, whereas it's probably gone down where, where you are. And I wish so much I could be with you in person to uh, see your beautiful country and interact with you more personally. But I'm glad for the technology that lets us uh, teleport around the globe like this to do uh, things like this where we can be together, at virtually at least. I'll note just in, in passing, since it has some relevance to our topic today, that our lives are saturated with the effects of science. If you were to show people from a hundred years ago what we're doing today, they would have thought it was magic, right? Scientists really have done a remarkable job at discovering and understanding the way the material world works. That doesn't mean, of course, that everything science says is correct. But when you look at our lives, we have to admit that science is deeply involved in almost every facet. The medicine we take, the food we eat, the vehicles we drive, television we watch, the internet we use, science has earned the right to be heard. And I'll even say that science has earned the right to be trusted as long as it sticks to its proper area of authority. And that's part of the question, right? And it's what we'll end up talking about today. What is the proper area of authority for science? And when does it go too far? Let me start with a bit on science and theology in general, and then we'll narrow down to the title of this presentation, Is Biblical Christianity Compatible with Evolution? So let me see if I can get the science and technology to work correctly here and share my screen with you so you can see some PowerPoint slides. Got it? All right, so I am going to start with a psalm, Psalm 19, and ask you to pay attention particularly to the two sections that highlight different ways that God has communicated, different ways that God has communicated to the psalmist and also to us. So Psalm 19 begins with, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens, makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. And then the next part. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. In the first part of the psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God. They pour forth speech. They reveal knowledge. I'm not claiming that 
David was an astronomer in the modern sense of the world. I'm not claiming that this passage of scripture says anything scientific about the universe. It's merely the observation of one who spent a lot of time out on the hillsides tending sheep at night and observed the created order. He saw what God had made and said that we can learn from it. The second part of the psalm shifts to the law of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commands and decrees. This is where God has revealed knowledge in a different way, through scripture, through the prophets, and by the time we get to the New Testament, through Jesus Christ. So here in this one psalm, I think we can find reason to trust science and to trust scripture as sources of knowledge. There's a metaphor that's been used throughout church history for this approach, often known as the two books metaphor. According to it, God has given us instruction through two different books, the book of God's word, which we know to be the Bible, and the book of God's works, which is the created order of things, what God has done in the world. As far back as the fourth century, one of the church fathers used this metaphor. John Chrysostom in 347 to 407 were his dates. He had said, if God had given instruction by means of books and of letters, he who knew letters would have learned what was written, but the illiterate man would have gone away without receiving any benefit. This cannot be said with respect to the heavens, but the Scythian, the barbarian, and Indian, and Egyptian, and every man that walks on the earth shall hear this voice, for not by means of the ears, but through sight, it reaches our understanding. Upon this volume, another word for a book, upon this book, the unlearned as well as the wise man should be able to look, and wherever anyone may chance to come there, looking upwards toward heaven, he'll receive a sufficient lesson from the view of them. And then one of the important documents of the Protestant Reformation and still used for the Reformed Church today is the Belgic Confession. Article 2 of it says, We know God by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, which is before our eyes as a most beautiful book, wherein all creatures, great and small, are as so many letters leading us to perceive clearly God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.20. All these things are sufficient to convict men and leave them without excuse. Second, he makes himself more clearly and fully known to us by his holy and divine word, as far as is necessary for us in this life to his glory and our salvation. So we have God's word. And we have God's works. By studying God's word, we are theologians. By studying God's works, what God has created, we are scientists. Even scientists who are not Christians, we believe, are studying the works of God. Even they are learning something of God and of God's world that he made. Okay, so with that background, understanding two books by which God has uh, communicated to us, I'm going to make two claims. I'm going to make two propositions for us to consider here. Two things that I personally believe and want to uh, walk through these a little bit to see how it is that, uh, that a Christian can believe both of these. So the first one, I fully believe that God intentionally created humans in his image. Now, that we get from the book of God's word, human beings created in the image of God, and that we are not accidents, that God did this intentionally on purpose. Secondly, evolution is the best scientific explanation for how Homo sapiens came to exist. There I use the scientific term, Homo sapiens, which scientists use to describe our species. And I say that evolution is the best scientific description. One of the big points I want to get across here today is that science, so now I'm taking this from the book of God's works, what God has done, what scientists have uncovered by careful observation and experimentation, is a good explanation in a limited sense. Sometimes we hear from scientists who think that 
uh, when science decides something that it counts for everything, that science is the only kind of explanation there is. And I wholly resist that. So this is why I put both of these uh, both of these claims up on the screen together, that I believe on the one hand that God intentionally created us and created us to be his image bearers, gave us a special role within the created order. And I believe this through the book of God's word, what God has revealed in scripture. And I believe that evolution is the best scientific description. So the first question that may come up to something like this is, how do we have two different, very different sounding explanations for the same thing, which is why do we exist? Well, before answering this question specifically with regard to evolution, let me give a, uh, an illustration that I think is much less controversial and that all of us will accept that this kind of thing goes on, that we can have different kinds of explanations for the same thing. So on the screen, you see the picture of a boiling tea kettle. This is an example that is quite often used. It's not original to me, but I like to use it a lot for uh, this description. So let's just uh, imagine in our minds that we come walking into a room and off in the corner, we see a tea kettle that is boiling. And the person walking into the room might ask the question, why is the tea kettle boiling? And let's say sitting at the table is a scientist who says, oh, I can give you an explanation for why the tea kettle is boiling. Namely, the electrical circuit was closed and electrons flowing through the coil generated heat, which was conducted to the kettle. That made the molecules of water move more rapidly under the vapor, un, until the vapor pressure of the liquid exceeds the atmospheric pressure. Now, I'm not a specialist in thermodynamics, but I think that's the kind of scientific explanation for why water boils. We generate a heat source. That heat source excites the molecules of water until it reaches a certain point relative to the atmosphere, and then the water starts boiling. I want to say this is a true and correct scientific explanation that answers the question, why is the kettle boiling? But now let's say also that same situation, I walk into the room, I see off in the corner, there's a tea kettle boiling. I ask the question, why is the kettle boiling? And somebody else who may or may not be a scientist is sitting there and answers the question, because I wanted a cup of tea. That's not a scientific explanation, but isn't it a true explanation? And does that explanation have any conflict with the scientific explanation? What I'm trying to show is, depending on the circumstances, depending on the context, I might give very different sounding explanations to the same event, and that both of them can be true. And that when I, when I know both of them, I have a better, bigger picture of the, of the event than I do if I, only, if I only consider one. If we said, when the scientist answers this question about the tea kettle boiling with all of this scientific fancy terminology, if we said that told the whole story, we'd be missing the personal side of things. Because it turns out that there is a person who wants something, who desires something, and acted intentionally to bring that about. It's just that I can describe those actions and intentions with science as well, but they don't quite tell the whole story. This is what I'm claiming is similar when I asked the previous question, why do we exist? A scientist might give the scientific explanation about evolution, about common ancestors that we have with other life forms. They could talk about things like the fossil record and the genetic code and how similar our bodies are to other animals and how they have this shared history. But they might also appeal to a person, namely the person of God, the person who said, I want human beings to exist, just like this person in our fictional room said, I want a cup of tea, and took actions to bring it about, which can be described by science. Okay, so I think it's possible 
that we can have two different kinds of explanations for for something like this. So let me turn more specifically to the Bible and to scientific explanations and start to get a little closer to our uh, stated topic of evolution. So when I look at scripture, one of the things I think that is clearly affirmed is that God created, right? So not just from the Genesis accounts, but here's, the, here's a passage from the New Testament, Colossians. He, and here we're talking about Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created. Things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I think that's pretty clear. All things have been created through Christ. Okay, but let's give some examples now and see how this, this fits. Here's a picture of the Hawaiian Islands. If I were to come to the Philippines, I would probably stop in the Hawaiian Islands on the way over there. and. If, as scripture just said, all things have been created through Christ, then I'm going to say that the Hawaiian Islands are one of those things. God created the Hawaiian Islands. Do you believe that? I do. I think God created the Hawaiian Islands. But also, I have stood on the big island right there at the, down at the corner here, where there is still lava flowing out into the ocean, continuing to add to the landmass of the Hawaiian Islands. And with this picture where you can see the underwater profile of these, you can see, and we have worked out over the last several generations, how it is that there's a crack in the Earth's surface right there that's moving and lava is pouring up and those islands have made a chain that you can follow all the way up around the Pacific Rim in some cases. And we, so we have a very, uh, a very detailed scientific understanding of how these islands came to exist. Does our having that scientific explanation somehow mean that God didn't really create the Hawaiian Islands? Here I want to appeal back to the kind of method that I, that I suggested with the teapot, where I can give a detailed scientific explanation, but I can also talk about a person and the intentions and purposes that that person has and describe at a different level the same event. So why are there Hawaiian islands? I think God created them, that God desired for them to exist. Why are there the Hawaiian islands? Because lava is pouring out through a crack in the seafloor and adding to the landmass. These are two different explanations, but I want to say that they're both true. They're both true. Here's another example. God created, I think God created everything. Well, what else does that include? I think it also includes God created me. God created each of you. The psalmist says God knit us together in our mother's womb. I believe that we are not accidents, that God intended for us to be here, that God created us personally. But there I'm using language that appeals to that personal level of explanation, just like the man who said, I wanted a cup of tea. God created me because we also now know pretty well where babies come from. And I won't get into lots of details here, but your mother and your father loved each other very much and they created something through a scientific process, or at least through a process that we can understand scientifically. So I believe God created me. God knit me together in my mother's womb, but I also know how the process works scientifically. When there's a sperm and an egg and an exchange of DNA and how it comes together, and it's marvelous, but we understand it scientifically, and that scientific explanation does not take away at all from the fact that God knit us together in our mother's womb. Many of the scientists that work with the organization I work for, BioLogos, speak to the fact that sometimes people feel like when you can explain something scientifically that it takes away all the mystery of it. They say exactly the opposite. 
the scientists who are actually working in the laboratories and the observatories and working with the book of God's works say, when I come to understand a process scientifically, it just makes me marvel all the more at what God has done. One of the, uh, one of the men who is on the, uh, the board for Biologos is the chairman of the zoology department at the University of Wisconsin, which is one of our leading institutions for science. And he works on the development of embryos to see how this process works in lots of different species. And it turns out it works very similar to how it does in human beings. And he is one of those who says, I just praise God all the more when I understand this incredibly intricate process by which he has brought about life, by which he has allowed life to exist. So God created me individually, and yet we have a scientific explanation for how that came to be. So I think what we can say about each of us individually we can say about our species. So I'm saying again that human beings were created in the image of God. But I am also saying evolution is the best scientific description of how Homo sapiens evolved. Evolution still has lots of mysteries to uncover. It's a fairly recent science, all things considered. And there are lots of ways that it continues to change and to develop itself as we uncover more and more. It's only been in the last couple of generations that the uh, dramatic fossil evidence has come to light. We have a museum in Washington, D.C. called the Smithsonian. And there, there is a, the, an exhibit called the Hall of Human Origins. And in it is a display of fossilized skulls from other uh, hominids or hominins that have been uncovered, which now total fossils from more than 6,000 individuals over the last uh, 100,000 years or so that have been uncovered that we didn't know about just 100 years ago or 200 years ago. So that kind of evidence is rapidly advancing. Genetics, though, is even newer. So the man who formed uh, the organization I work for, Biologos, Kyle talked about him a bit, Francis Collins, was the leader of the Human Genome Project that took our DNA and unraveled it to uh, be able to understand how does our DNA, what are all of the, the letters of the DNA. So again, we have the metaphor of a book that we're reading there. That only happened 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago. And since then, uh, many, many more advances have been made in understanding genetics and had it's become one of the most powerful evidences for showing how we are related to other species. So when I say human beings were created in the image of God, I'm making a theological statement. And when I say evolution is the best scientific description of how Homo sapiens evolved, I'm making a scientific statement. And just like the tea kettle statements, I don't think these are in conflict with each other. I can hold to both of them without conflict. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to find evolution in the Bible, okay? So it doesn't mean that God somehow revealed to people 2,000, 3,000 years ago that he created that God created through evolution. That wouldn't have made any sense to the people at that time. So in the same way, we don't see anything in the Bible about photosynthesis, the way plants create oxygen for us to breathe. We don't see anything in the Bible about other galaxies. We don't see anything in the Bible about viruses, which are very important in our world today to understand, right? These were scientific advances that were so far beyond the original audience of Scripture that it wouldn't have made any sense for God to reveal or to speak in those kinds of terms. God revealed himself to those cultures and those times. So the original question we were asking was, is biblical Christianity compatible with evolution? So let's think about that 
question for just a minute. Compatible might mean simply that the two are not logically inconsistent with each other. And when we understand these two statements as belonging to different kinds of explanations, just like we saw with the tea kettle, then they're not at all logically inconsistent because they're speaking to different aspects of reality or different ways of knowing. But we might want to push further than simply the absence of logical contradiction between the two. When we ask if they're compatible, we might want something stronger, some way of seeing that they fit together. And remember I said we're already, I already said we're not going to find modern science in the Bible. So I don't mean that we should go looking at individual verses to try to uncover secret meanings or something that seem to be speaking to evolution. Rather, we want to see if the grand themes, the big ideas of both evolution and from Scripture, the story of of, uh, of reality from scripture to see if these big ideas are compatible. Do they resonate with each other? And this is harder and more open to interpretation, but let me suggest one way that I think people find them to be incompatible, and then I'll give a response to that, and then I'll suggest another way that I think the two resonate very well together. So, I skipped over this slide. <sighs> the hard question, and it's a hard question for everybody, no matter what position you come from on the science, but it's sometimes suggested that evolution is incompatible with the story of Scripture because of death. On this view, death is the primary uh, mode of evolution, and for Christianity, death is the enemy to be defeated. Death is how sin came into the world, so there could not have been death before humans sinned. Well, let me say just a couple things in response to that. For the science of evolution, death is not what accomplishes anything. Okay, For evolution to work, you need reproductive fitness. Well, what do I mean by that? For evolution to work, we recognize that parents have offspring and that their offspring are a little bit different than the parents are. And then some of those offspring are better suited to having more offspring than others are. That's reproductive fitness. That offspring are going to vary, and depending on the environmental circumstances, some of those variations are going to be more conducive to reproduction. Nothing has to die in that regard. Now, it turns out that if nothing died, we'd quickly be overrun by, everything, by all of the uh, organisms in the world. But that's not evolution, right? That's not a mark against evolution any more than it would be a mark against what is sometimes known as old earth creationism. Science has shown pretty definitively that the earth is very old, four billion years old and that life has been around for at least half that time, and organisms have continued to develop all throughout that time. But death is not the means that evolution works. Reproductive fitness is how evolution works. So then it's really only the young earth creationism view that makes this criticism about, well, death came into the world because of sin. But I would say that when we read these uh, passages, that it's human death came into the world through sin. The Apostle Paul in Romans 5 is pretty clearly referring to human death, not to the deaths of mosquitoes and fish and plants and bacteria. We understand that these have been around a long time and that they have lived and that they have died. So we can talk more about this uh, concern and criticism with death in the question time if you want to. But let me uh, suggest finally, and with this I'll uh, close and we'll get to our question time. Let me suggest one way that I think the Bible resonates really well with evolution. And that's this. God did not originally create things the way he ultimately intended them to be. This is such an important point. 
And even for people who take Genesis 1 very literally with six 24-hour days, we have to admit that God didn't originally create things the way he ultimately intended them to be. Why did it take six days? But then the point that I really want to emphasize, even at the end of those six days, after God creates humans and says all of his creation is very good, the next thing that God says is to tell humans to fill and subdue the earth. That ought to make us ask, if God wanted the world filled and subdued, why didn't he create it already filled and subdued? So creation itself is going somewhere. There's a process. God created things and said, this is very good, but it wasn't yet what he ultimately intended it to be. So there is a process. We might talk more about the process of bringing human beings into existence through evolution. I think I'll leave it there for now, though, and merely note that there must be a reason God didn't create heaven to begin with and just put us all there. He thought there was a purpose for this world and for our existence in it to become something, for Jesus himself to become incarnate. So we see a God who creates through process rather than instantaneously. That is perfectly compatible with evolution. I'm sure there are lots of questions still, and I'm happy to address those in the question and answer time. Let me uh, just quickly point you to some other resources that my organization, BioLogos, might help with. We have a short video series. There are 10 two-minute animated videos that walks through a lot of what I just said here today about how evolution can be compatible with biblical Christianity. We call it the BioLogos Basics video series. If you can see that URL, you can get to it from there. But even if you just type into a Google search, uh, uh, search query, uh, BioLogos Basics videos, it should bring that up to you. And then there are lots of other questions related to all of this, and we have a big section of our website called Common Questions on Science and Biblical Faith, where you can find uh, short descriptions of these and answers that we think work to uh, show the compatibility of these two. Finally, Kyle mentioned that I'm the host of a podcast that Biologos puts out. Our podcast is called Language of God, and wherever you listen to podcasts, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or Google or even just on our webpage, you can find this where we talk, almost every week we release new episodes of having conversations with scientists and theologians and others who are really interested in exploring how science and faith can fit together. And uh, there are more than 50 episodes listed on there now, and we're continuing to produce some more. So let me uh, end there and just say thank you so much for uh, your time and attention, and I'm happy to uh, answer any other questions that you might have now. Dr. Stump, thank you for uh, taking your early morning to, to help us to kind of grasp this concept that I know a lot of people think about. And just to kind of sum up what you're saying is, there are categories that the world is kind of separated into, that there's the physical world, which is the scientific world. And so when we, when we create an explanation based on the physical world, that does not necessarily have to conflict with a theological explanation that is just like what you used in the metaphor of the kettle. And so with this question, um, what we want to do now is we want to transition into your questions. So Dr. Stump has given us an overview, and he's laid out a clear case that these two things, because they're in separate categories, they are, they are compatible because of the category distinction. So Jihan, you want to start by asking our first question? Uh, sure. So we have a couple of questions here from our Zoom call participants. And yeah, so we're going to start with the very first question asked by Mr. Obed. He said here, Dr. Jim, what can you say to people who believe in microevolution, evolution from species to species, but do not believe in macroevolution? So evolution across kingdoms, genus. So, yeah. That's a distinction that is often made, um, microevolution versus macroevolution. The problem itself is wholly artificial. 
because macroevolution is no different than just lots and lots of microevolution stacked up over longer and longer stretches of time. The difficulty for us is that evolution happens on such a long time scale that it's very difficult for us to see. And you might think of it in... Um, in relation to how difficult it is for us to understand vast, vast distances away. So how far am I away from all of you in the Philippines? Several thousand miles, right? 10,000 miles, something like this. Well, that's nothing, and it seems so far, but that's nothing in comparison to how far it is from here to the sun, 93 million miles. And that is nothing in comparison to how far it is to the next closest star. And that's nothing in comparison to the light years, to the millions of light years now that we know, to the billions of light years that our galaxy is. Our minds can't understand that. We can't fathom it because it's so far out outside of what our normal experience is. Same thing with regard to time. We think back to last week and how far away it is. We think back to the beginning of our lives, and we know something about our parents and our ancestors, but that's still such a small, small time scale compared to how far history goes back in time. And as evolution works over such long time scales, it's difficult for us. There's no different process. It's just that small, small adaptations over long periods of time, and then because the, the conditions themselves change over time, those add up to where if you look at the one from today to its ancestor, 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 if you go back a hundred generations of ancestors, you start to see some difference. If you go back a thousand generations, you'll see very marked differences. And if you go back a million generations, you're going to see that these two things don't look even close to the same anymore. Now, what we do as scientists is to try to organize all of that and call things like species, and then here's the same genus and phylum and kingdom and all of the rest of these, but those are all our human categories that we've tried to impose to say, here are groups of similar things, okay? So when we see scripture in uh, Genesis 1 talking about after their own kind, that's very much an observation of it. There are, there are similar kinds, kinds of things. And when you look at them at any one snapshot in time, you can group together. These are similar, and these are similar, and these are similar. But if we had the historic view that goes back in time, we would see that those things have changed over time. One of the videos that I pointed you to in that Biologos Basics series discusses this exact difference between what uh, people call microevolution and macroevolution and tries to, tries to show how this is, there is one in the same process, it's just what is the time scale that, that we're using. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for, uh, for uh, responding to that question. Uh, there's another question here. I think. Um, this is quite more specific because, um, as we know, there are different theories in evolution, right? It's not just, it's not just uh, one theory. There are different theories in evolution. So I think this question is about that. What specific theory of evolution is coherent with the biblical answer to the best explanation of creation? So that's basically a question. Yeah, that's a good question. And I, it was something I didn't uh, touch on at all. So... Um, let me, uh, let me use the, the phrase common ancestry as what I am talking about with evolution when I say it's compatible with Christianity. So common ancestry is just the theory that if you take any two organisms in the world and trace their ancestors back far enough, you would eventually get to where they have common ancestors, right? So there are sometimes some views of evolution that are put out there that say, oh, we evolved from chimpanzees or human beings evolved from monkeys. No, that is not the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution is if you were to take human beings and chimpanzees and go back in time far enough, which we think now is about six or seven million years ago, you would find a population that's neither human, nor is it chimpanzee, but it 
it somehow got separated and evolved separately and had lots and lots and lots of distinct of small variations accumulate over time and that there wasn't any mating between these two that would keep those gene pools similar so they were separated from each other and they developed over time and finally we get to the point where we are now where these are two very different populations so common ancestry is just that theory of evolution that says everything is related. There's another part of evolution that says, and here's exactly how it happened. Random mutations plus natural selection led to all of that. Now, if that's all we said about evolution, it would be fair to question whether that is compatible with biblical Christianity where there is a God who intentionally created me and you and human beings as a whole. But that's not, that's, that's not a good scientific description even of evolution to say that's the only thing that's happening. Scientists have lots of debates and discussions and even arguments about the mechanisms that help to bring about common ancestry. And not everybody agrees on that. So sometimes opponents of evolution will talk about how evolution as a science is in such disarray and and uh, it's a theory in crisis even. Well, they're not talking about common ancestry. 99% of biologists hold to common ancestry. It's not 100%, but it's very hard to find any question where you'll get 100%, right? But 99% of them hold to common ancestry. But many of them argue about what are the other kinds of mechanisms that are in play that make that happen. And that's a fine area of scientific inquiry. That's why I said there are still lots of mysteries with regard to evolution. But it is settled beyond all reasonable doubt. At the, at the same level of the earth is round that common ancestry has happened, that we are related to, uh, to uh, each other through common ancestry. Um, so I think that's an important distinction to make, that the, the claim of common ancestry as opposed to the scientific details of how it happens, which, which there are uh, lots of suggestions. So those scientific details I'm talking about, the mechanisms are how do we produce variation among our offsprings? So there are genetic mutations, and it seems from our perspective that they're random. For in human beings, from parents to children, there are about 50 to 70 genetic mutations out of the three billion that each parent contributes to the genes of, of a new person. So 50 to 70 out of a total of six billion base pairs that we have is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. How else does that variation come about? It seems that environmentally there are some causes of that. We don't understand this completely. I just saw, I think two days ago, uh, sci the title of a scientific paper about identical twins that we had always assumed have the exact same DNA. Well, it turns out that even in identical twins after their two cells have separated, that there are some mutations that takes place. So they look at, at identical twins today and find that, oh, these two actually do vary a little bit. We don't understand all of that yet, but we know that the variation that occurs from parents to children then allows some of those organisms to be more successful in reproducing, and those are the ones that tend to pass on their genes further. So that's, that's a good question, and anybody who wants to dig further into the details might be interested in a in a topic that's called the extended evolutionary synthesis, which some scientists, these are not religious people that are trying to, to perpetuate some religious idea, but scientists themselves who are saying, we need to have a bigger understanding of the evolutionary process as a whole. And it includes more than just genetic mutations, so. All right, I think, so what I'm doing here, Dr. is that there are a couple of questions here, and then I'm just trying to go through a process from the most fundamental until the most, uh, what I call the basic kinds of questions. So before we proceed to the questions where we allow the participants to talk to you, I'm just going to uh, proceed to the next question here posted in the chat. So it's since you mentioned about common ancestries, some people might be uh, misunderstand what it means. So let me just 
give you the chance to uh, clarify what it means by asking this question. So, does this mean that when God created Adam and Eve, He created the astro- Australopithecus and not the Homo sapiens? And <laughs> is Adam the first man ever to live on Earth? So, I, I guess you already said it on the lecture, but I think this is a good time to cater for those who just entered. So Adam and Eve is a topic that comes up a lot when we start talking about evolution because it sure seems to us, if we just pick up the Bible and read it, that it says God created these first two people. What we don't understand when we read the Bible, in, for me, in English and in many other languages that have been translated from the original Hebrew, is that the word Adam that we translate into English was not originally the name of a person. Adam means the man, and Eve means the mother of all living. And if we would hear that, we would immediately go, oh, this is a different kind of story that's being told here. This is a story that's being told about humanity. Where did God bring humanity from? And sometimes people are uh, a little nervous about this common ancestry when I say, if we go from my ancestors back in time a long way, we'll get to the same ancestors as chimpanzees. And they say, we we weren't made from chimpanzees. And I say, so when you read in uh, Genesis chapter 2 that we came from dirt, is that better somehow to think that our origins trace back to, to dirt and to dust? So... I I think we've been led down uh, a difficult path that takes Adam and Eve as they have to be these first two people. We know from genetics that that all of our gene pool did not come from only two people 6,000 years ago. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. So we have to be able to be open to thinking about other interpretations. So as Christians, we ought to affirm that the Bible is inspired by God. We ought to affirm it as an authority, but we should also be careful in saying any one of our interpretations of that Bible is somehow inspired or inerrant, because I don't think it is. And so so we need to work together with, with experts, both in the sciences, but also as well as in understanding these ancient languages and the cultures that this came from. Now, none of this means that there couldn't have been an Adam and Eve. God could have made an Adam and Eve. God could have selected out of the uh, evolving uh, hominin population two people and entered into relationships specifically with them. There's no problem with that scientifically. And I think it fits scripture as well to see that there must have been other people around, even in the story of Adam and Eve. For when Cain kills Abel and gets sent off, he's worried about what other people are going to do to him, right? And you have to say, wait a second, I thought these were the first two kids in the, in the whole world. Why would there be anybody else? And uh, so he's worried, he's worried about that. But it says that he went off and he built cities, you know, so it, it sure seems as though scripture itself is not making some kind of claim that these were the only people around. So that gives us some liberty, I think, to read these stories and to try to understand them in more of the theological sense. So like my tea kettle boiling example, to understand more as an explanation of who are we and where did we come from in the theological sense, where God is saying, I created these people to be my image bearers. And then we can also look to the sciences and say, okay, how exactly did this happen? When and where? Those are scientific kinds of questions rather than theological questions. So uh, again, I'm perfectly happy to say God intentionally created us, but I don't think we have to understand that as somehow being in conflict with human beings evolved over time in a population, right? So... Lots of questions come up with how do we, if we really want to know, what, what if we were able to go back you know, 200, 300, 400,000 years ago and with a video camera and videotape what was actually going on? What would we find? And I think we can say with some certainty that there were populations of Homo sapiens that were coming out of Africa 70,000 years ago. But when they came out of Africa, there were already other 
if I say people, don't understand that as Homo sapiens, but there were Neanderthals and the Homo erectus, which had spread all over the entire globe, practically, not to the Americas here, but where you guys are, there were, there were already other people that they, were, that they were coming into contact with. And we know now that these Homo sapiens even interbred with some of these others that they, that they found. We have, in, unless, you co- unless you're from the continent of Africa proper, almost all of us have two to 4% of our genes come from Neanderthals, which was a different kind of, of uh, person a different kind we don't we don't know too much about them but we have lots of fossils of them and we see their dna in us so all of these things are adding to our understanding of what our human past was in the scientific sense that doesn't take away at all from the theological fact that god created us god created us and selected us to be his image bearers to the rest of to the rest of creation good that you mentioned it because a lot of a couple of questions here is about the Imago Dei. So since you already mentioned it, can you expound more on that? Uh, what does it mean for a homo sapien to possess the Imago Dei, the image of God? Yeah, so I would want to say that human beings possess the image of God. And the question is, are human beings exactly the same thing as homo sapiens? right? So Homo sapiens is a scientific category that we have tried to impose onto the data that we see, onto the book of God's works that we see everywhere. And that's tricky because Homo sapiens doesn't have a very clear beginning because this is an evolutionary process with lots and lots of little adaptations over time. So it's very difficult to say, here is exactly when Homo sapiens began. I think we can say, here is when humans began. And that's the point when God entered into a more specific relationship with us. So we have evolved over time to the point where we have the kind of capacities that we have. We have language. We have reason and rationality. We have morality. We know right and wrong, right? We had to have those kind of capacities before God could say, now I want you to be my image bearers to the rest of the world. I'm going to give you a specific duty, a specific job to do in this created order. So um, I want to say that human beings were created in the, image of, in the image of God, and that is to be God's representatives on earth. It appears as though God didn't want to do everything himself, that he wanted to enter into this relationship with his creatures that were capable of, of uh, demonstrating to the rest of the world what his purposes were. He wants us to enter into that. Now, in our human story, we know that we have sinned and we've messed that up and we did not do what God wanted us to do. So God sends his son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins and to empower us to be the kind of people that God originally wanted us to be. And so we now look to the end of the story. Quite often in this conversation, we're looking at the beginning of the story, where where we came from. But I think we need to look to the end of the story to understand those purposes. And ultimately, God wants us to reign and rule with Christ forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth. So we have to become the kind of people who are capable of doing that. And that requires some of these physical capabilities we have or mental capabilities that we have, but it also requires a kind of spiritual maturity. And one of the things uh, that I think resonates really well with evolution is that there is a process to that. God didn't just snap his fingers and immediately put us all in this final heaven right? He created these people who had to go through a process and take some ownership of their own development to become the kind of people. Yes, we still needed the work of Christ in all of this, but we have some responsibility ourselves to become the kind of people who can reign and rule with Christ forever and ever. So, we see the process. We see that God has intended for these things to happen this way, and that fits with are having an evolutionary past, a history by which we developed. And because we can see that, we see that there are other species that have hints of rationality. Chimpanzees are really bright. 
whales and dolphins and octopus are really bright creatures that can be trained in some ways, but they have nothing like the kind of capabilities that we have. So I don't want to reduce the image of God to just having certain capabilities. I think the image of God is much more about the role that God has given us within the created order. But in order to fulfill that role, we have to have certain capabilities. So language and reason and morality and even emotion these things have natural histories to them. So again, back to the tea kettle example, we could ask, where does rationality come from? And we can give now increasingly complete story from the sciences of how reason and rationality develops in a species. But I still want to say theologically that God made us to be reasonable beings so that we could help to fulfill the role that we have as image bearers. So all of those capabilities have a scientific description, but we also see how God intended them in us so that we could be his image bearers. And Dr. Stump, just to clarify a little more, BioLogos works with bona fide Old Testament Hebrew scholars like Dr. John Walton, right? So these things aren't just coming from scientists who have no biblical background, but you guys are working with some of the best scholars on this material on the planet. And John Walton talks about this quite a bit in his material. So one of the criticisms that groups like us get sometimes is that, they, is that people want to say, you're letting science determine your theology. And I want to push back and say, no, that's not the case. Sometimes what science can do is to get us to look again at our theology, at our biblical studies, to see have we maybe fallen into some cultural assumptions that are not warranted. And so some of these Old Testament scholars, people like John Walton and Tremper Longman and, yes, people who have spent their lives studying the biblical material themselves, they will say, I'm not letting science determine this, but maybe I let science say, here's a good question you should ask about the Bible. Here's a good question you should ask about the original cultures in which the Bible came to be. And that led me back to do my own work even better, to understand better what by, what the Bible is telling me, as opposed to letting my culture decide what the Bible is telling me. So can I proceed to the next question? Are you still available? I you still am available. You still, you still, you still welcome. So this is more about, uh, about the origin of sin. So how do we reconcile the origin of sin while holding to the tension of scientific and biblical view of humans. So I think this is trying to question how death was even present prior to the human death and, uh, and sin. These are hard questions, and don't let me uh, sound like I have all of the answers neatly wrapped up and it stops all conversation, because there ought to be more conversation. This is a, this is a hard question, and not everybody is going to agree. I think there are two different possibilities, broadly speaking, of how to think about this. And this is also related to the image of God. One, we could have a very punctilinear event, something very sudden and abrupt where we can see before and after and some big change that happened. Or secondly, there could be a gradual event where if we look at one end of the process and the other end of the process, we would see a big difference, but it's messy in the middle and we're not sure just when to say that it changed over from one to the, to the other. So think about the image of God and think about sin in this way. It could be that there was a population of early humans or proto-humans, something before Homo sapiens that is evolving, evolving, evolving. And then at one point, God says, now I'm going to breathe my breath into you. Now I'm going to give you a soul or a spirit. Now I'm going to reveal myself directly to you. You are now human beings in my image. And I'm telling you right from wrong. And if you do anything different after this point, we're going to call it sin. And that's going to enter into the world and destroy lots of things. And so from then on, we had prior to this, 
they weren't even really human beings. So any bad things, if one of them killed another one, we wouldn't call that sin any more than we call when one dog kills another dog. We don't call that sin, right? Because they didn't know any better. But if there was a point where God reveals himself, makes them fully human, now if they did that same action, we would call it sin because they know better, because they've become awakened to the spiritual realities in their life. But I don't want to say that had to go that way. I want to think, too, about the possibility of there being a process by which we come to awareness of what is right and wrong, by which we become more and more and more fully aware of the obligations that have been put on me. And here I'll use another example that I think we're all familiar with. Each one of us, or if you have children that grow up from a baby to an adult, can you say, here is the point at which they became responsible for what they did? I have three sons. They're all in their 20s now, but we hold them responsible for things now that we didn't hold them responsible for when they were only 16 years old. And when they were 16, we held them responsible for things we didn't hold them responsible for when they were 10 years old or when they were two years old. I have a grandson now who's one year old. He can barely speak. He barely, you know, we don't hold him responsible for things. So think of that same process with us as a species. Could it be that God begins revealing himself to us and we're only vaguely aware of this and that God is holding us responsible for some things when we were in that very early stage of development that later on we become more responsible for, that we come to understand more of what God has has uh, desired and intended for us, and that that process continues, 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 so that just like our our physical evolution, there could be a spectrum or a long process of development in the in the spiritual sense. So I think either of those is a is a fair is a fair possibility to talk about. Does this happen dramatically in one instant? Or does it happen gradually over a longer period of time? And we have examples in each of those that we can point to. So depending on which of those you go with, you're going to answer the question about sin and death differently. So um, <clears throat> again, I think when Paul in Romans 5 says that death came into the world through sin, we fully affirm that. But do we say that that was a dramatic instantaneous process or was it a gradual process? So either way we go, we're affirming that the cause of human death is sin, that we have all sinned. I mean, that's, I think, a, a fact from the New Testament that we can easily verify that every one of us has sinned. Yes, there's a question about when and how that happened, but there's no question that it did happen. So similarly, if we were walking down the street together and we saw a dead dog on the side of the road, or let's say we saw a, a dog on the side of the road that was in bad shape, still alive, we might go to it and say, we need to help this dog and take it somewhere. We might not know exactly how it happened, but we still know that the condition that it's in and the kind of uh, help that it needs in order to get better. Because sometimes people who are opponents of evolution say, well, if evolution happened, then you don't know how sin started, and then we have no reason for Jesus to come. And I just don't think that follows at all. We know the condition that human beings are in. We know that we have all sinned. We know that we need a savior. How did it get to be that way? Well, we can have different views on that, and we can try to understand both the scientific evidence as well as the biblical evidence, and we might disagree about it, but we all agree that human beings have sinned and that we need a savior. Kyle, are you going to say something? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Stump, we were hoping for this question to have Dr. Bethany Solerator come on because she has a great book on God and evolution and animal suffering. And so hopefully this is just kind of a spoiler alert for those of you that are here. We're really hoping to bring on another scholar who's answered this question in a, a really sufficient way. And she's, she's a female philosopher. She's brilliant. So yeah, uh, uh, can you endorse her work? <laughs> 
I can, and I can even point you to the podcast episode that I had with her where we talked through her book. So you can go back. I think it's like episode number 10 or 11, somewhere, somewhere pretty early on. I sat down just after her book on this topic had come out and we talked through, and I agree that I think she's fantastic in trying to understand the difference. And so what that is, I mean, what she's really 